Good afternoon, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this IIEA seminar and the online conversation with Professor Peter Piot. We'll be joined by Professor shortly, but I just want to give out some housekeeping messages from the IIEA. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion through the question and answers fu function on the Zoom, and you should see that at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to send in your questions during the presentation uh, if they occur to you. I just want to remind you today that the conversation is on the record, not always in the IIEA, and this time it is on the record. And also for those of you who use it, you could join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Now, we are so pleased today, Professor Peter Piot, to have you join us for this fireside, a bit early in the day for the fireside chat. Professor Piot is a highly qualified uh, person in the area we're going to talk about. Um, he is a Handa Professor of Global Health and former director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Currently, he is the special advisor on COVID-19 to president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. He was a founding executive director of UN AIDS and undersecretary of the United Nations. He's a clinical uh, clinician and a microbiologist by training, although I see from your CV, Professor, you started off in engineering and then switched. He was with somebody else, co-discovered the Ebola virus in Zaire in 1976, and then subsequently led pioneering research on HIV AIDS, women's health and infectious diseases. He has so many academic qualifications and positions that I'm not going to read them all out today, if you don't mind, because you are so highly qualified. But I would recommend to people who are on this seminar to look at Peter Piot's uh, CV and just see how expert and how lucky we are to have him here talking to us. Um, I want to start today, Peter, if you don't mind, first of all, by saying you're a very warm welcome to the Institute. Um, we normally get people coming to the Institute who have, as you have, many of qualifications. Some of them have OBEs and MBs and all sorts of qualifications after their name. But I'm delighted to say that today you are a little bit different. You have what's called the o Order of the Leopard from the Democratic mm -hmm. Republic of the Congo. You have the Order of the Rising Sun from Japan and you have the Order of the Lion from Senegal. Now I can absolutely tell you there is nobody watching today who has any of those orders and it's very, very special to, that you have those kind of qualifications. I also, in reading your, your, your background, you have had a really exciting life, including very nearly getting on a plane that subsequently sadly crashed. You also were on a plane where the engine fell off and you had to glide back down to the earth uh, in the plane. So you are a, a man full of adventure and, and interest apart from your scientific interest. Um, and having a little bit of a background myself in the science world, I started my career in the pharmaceutical industry in a company that has merged over the years into Bristol Mars. Um, but I know for a long time, scientists and people like yourself, immunologists, virologists, mm -hmm. we didn't really get noticed by the world. But when this pandemic, so when this virus hit the world, suddenly we needed to turn to people like you for our, our knowledge. So thousands of scientists were mobilized when this, when this virus hit, hit the world. Would you talk to us a bit about how, as the special advisor to Ursula von der Leyen, you were able to get people to work together and what kind of system you set up to get um, the, the action started, looking at how minimal at the beginning we thought this was going to be and then how it grew. So maybe you might start there, maybe making reference to the establishment of HERA. Yeah, well, good to see you, Nora, and uh, great to be in Dublin, uh, as we think today in our virtual world. Uh, I used to be quite a, a frequent visitor of Dublin, um, meeting with government, with uh, uh, the NGO community when I was the executive director of, uh, of UNA. So I always have very fond memories. And also uh, I've seen how people are, uh, how active you are in that community level, particularly in um, 
yeah, in many, many countries, not only in, in Ireland. And um, yeah, I think first one of the silver linings of this uh, pandemic, and there are not that many, is actually uh, has been the, um, the achievements of science before talking about scientists, but the science is made by scientists. But the fact that we have a vaccine and that was, or several vaccines, um, and they were delivered in no time uh, with very high, uh, you know, efficacy. Um, uh, I, I always thought before we had a vaccine, like in uh, mid 2020, a good year ago, I thought, okay, if we have something that protects us for, let's say 50, 60% of the time, um, we should be happy. And here we have vaccines that protect us for 90% um, and made in no time. Although that's probably not really not correct because it's the result of um, decades of investment in both ba basic research and in industry um, in order to, uh, to, uh, you know, to be ready and to develop it. Mm -hmm. But um, the scientists indeed have come to the forefront um, of uh, this uh, dealing with this epidemic. And it's interesting, like uh, in May, I uh, attended the launch of the annual uh, trust barometer that uh, Edelman and company uh, publish. And uh, it's interesting that the uh, who are the people, that's one of the questions that you trust the most. And scientists came first. That was the first time on top, followed interestingly by CEOs of companies. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, <clears throat> and I think there, there are many reasons for that, but the big, uh, uh, challenge uh, for dealing with this epidemic is uncertainty. Is the uncertainty um, even at the beginning? I still very, uh, remember very well in in uh, January 2020, last year, um, when this news came from uh, from China, from Wuhan, uh, that there was this new virus, this uh, coronavirus, and and I I've been working with uh, viruses and dangerous epidemics my my whole life, from Ebola, HIV, and so on. Um, that uh, I, I thought, yeah, I knew that we would be in trouble, but I really didn't imagine it would be so bad. But uncertainty in the beginning of how is this transmitted exactly? Um, what can we do in the absence of uh, any vaccines uh, and any uh, treatment, any drugs? Um, and that's where scientists uh, you know, came to the forefront. Uh, those in you know, power and have to take the decisions we're relying on scientists. However, I should say that um, the role of scientists is to advise and to say this is the evidence. Uh, but I always say the scientists, the, the, those who are unhappy because a government doesn't follow what they say, then well, then you have to go into politics and you have to make sure you get elected. I mean, that's the, uh, you know, the decisions have to be made by, by those two people who have been empowered by in democracies, by, you know, the system, the, uh, the elections and so on and the people to take the decisions. Um, and uh, that's a quite a difficult dynamic sometimes because one of the basic, uh, uh, how to say, features of, of science and the practice of science is debate and arguing. Scientists love to argue with each other, challenge each other. Uh, and if you do that in, the, in public, uh, that can lead to confusion as well. And we have, so at the same time, the strong, um, believe in science and trust. And on the other hand, there's also a stronger anti-science movement, people who don't want to be vaccinated and so on. Now, coming to the um, to the EU and to my current um, yeah, position, which is a, a, a part-time position eh, uh, as advisor. Um, and I think what a few points there. One, uh, the um, health is not a, as they call, a competency of the European Union. That's right. And certainly, I would I would certainly not argue that uh, healthcare would uh, re become a competency. The the systems, the healthcare delivery systems, are so different from one country to another, and are grounded in history. In Germany, it goes back to Bismarck, you know, and so you don't want to you know change that. I I, I think. Um, however, when it comes to uh, cross border threats, as pandemics by definition are, I think there we. Um, it showed that we were not prepared. We were not prepared in general, but also not as a European Union. And in the beginning, um, <clears throat> there were even, um, you know, bans on export of uh, uh, protective equipment. Of, uh, you know, there was all kinds of reflexes, but that um, resolved. But so, <clears throat> and yet, um, no competency, but on the other hand, um, 
people rightly so expect that the EU does something because mm -hmm. it, uh, it affects us all. And I think there, um, there have been some uh, really uh, serious achievements. I mean, the joint procurement of, uh, of vaccines, for example, um, in the beginning, it was criticized. It was slower than in the UK, for example. But at the moment, in uh, many European countries, uh, including in Ireland, we have higher um, full vaccination rates than in the countries that were fast to get off, off the ground, you know, with this. And that's thanks to this uh, joint uh, effort, and particularly for smaller countries. I'm originally from Belgium. You know, we would have been at the end of the queue, uh, you know, in terms of uh, negotiating contracts and uh, uh, for, for procurement and so on. So that is the power of, yeah, um, I would say solidarity and, and, and yes. doing it together. It's like a buyer's club, basically. Um, also, uh, there is now a European certificate uh, proving that you're vaccinated because Europe, uh, even if you're living on an island, you know, people travel a lot and they go and so on. So we want to have something. Um, the recovery fund, we, this is not a health issue, but there's a massive recovery fund that is supporting countries to uh, to deal with the incredible damage societal wise, um, mental health, but also economically uh, of this epidemic. Now, how do we work? Um, I think what's key is that I am an advisor to the president of the European Commission, mm -hmm. which means that um, I'm not stuck in a silo. In any administration in the world, you're in silos. And when you deal with a pandemic, you know, even if you would be, this is a virus, is a, a disease, uh, you know, health is of course important, but you know, there are uh, so many other aspects. So you need a, in our jargon, a multi-sectoral approach. And that's something I've experienced with because that's what I try to do when dealing with, with HIV, with AIDS and saying it's a health problem, okay. But there are legal aspects, there are, you know, development, there's poverty, um, industrial development, uh, just name it. And um, that means that we can, uh, you know, come together. And, and uh, the president uh, uh, of, the, of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, regularly uh, hosts a meeting of all commissioners just on COVID. And I give her some, um, you know, updates. And uh, so that's to bring everybody up to the same level. And that's to see, OK, you're into um, finance and you're into, uh, you know, international development and law and so on, uh, the many legal aspects and so on. So that is that's one aspect. Secondly, I'm co-chairing with the Stella Kiriakides, the uh, uh, health commissioner mm -hmm. uh, from Cyprus and a, pl a platform and uh, on every two weeks. Uh, it was first every week. Um, of all national coordinators, and Ireland is there also, where we exchange information, because that's where it starts, you know, um, and I'm someone, I mean, I'm not a, um, a civil servant of the commission or so, because I'm interested in, you know, stopping this epidemic and making sure that the countries are in there, all the member states, um, and learning from our, uh, each other, that is really keen. But at the same time, we need to, um, make sure that we have much better instruments. We need a stronger uh, European Center for Disease Control, uh, European Medicines Agency. Uh, and I know that uh, Emer Cook from Ireland has been uh, you know, a guest here. Um, and also uh, it's clear that we are very vulnerable in terms of supply chains um, and a collective R&D effort, so on. And that's why uh, in her State of the Union address last year, a year ago, actually, Ursula von der Leyen announced the creation of what's now called HERA, the Health Emergency um, Response Agency, which, like in the US, is called BARDA. Um, you know, we now have, uh, hopefully, it will be, uh, you know, uh, approved this week, I hope, um, that there will be an instrument at European level to stimulate the development, not only of vaccines, but equipment, uh, have the procurement, have the uh, necessary intelligence and working closely with the member states and uh, and based at the commission. That's what uh, I think. And, and tomorrow she's giving her uh, State of the Union address, uh, the president. And uh, so that's something that uh, uh, I think will be a fantastic uh, uh, instrument for this, well, the health union. Um, and, and then we need some legal uh, um, ways of making sure that um, for cross-border threats, 
uh, you know, we can do it in a much sm smoother way. And um, so there's still a lot of work to be done, but uh, yes. uh, yeah. I, I just want to thank you very much indeed. I want to come back to you, Peter, on the, I know it's not established yet on the HERA model. Do you think that the EU members are more open now to working together on, on the health issues, seeing as how this time small countries, as you say, like Belgium and Ireland, we depended on the bigger countries to take decisions so we could get our share of PPE equipment, we could get our share of vaccines, we could get them at the prices we could afford. Do you think there is now a recognition that uh, this area of policy, including environmental control, including the availability of all the things that are needed, not just the vaccines, but even the glass vials that uh, yeah. the vaccines are yeah. in. Um, is that kind of coming together happening? I think I, I'm an optimist and I would say yes. In the beginning, the early days, what I saw was um, everybody for, their, for yourself, you know, and uh, uh, that was not so nice to see, and and that quest from you mentioned from the from a, equipment to glass vials to trucks couldn't bo uh, transport food, etc. I and I think that the there was um, the reaction of many many member states governments was okay. Health is not a uh, a competency of the Commission. We'll do it ourselves. I think that has changed a lot. Um, we all are in the same boat, and. Um, Frankly, if your neighbor's house is in, on fire, you can't say, sorry, that's not my, uh, you know, it's my neighbor's house. Uh, I, I'm not going to do anything. No, we need a fire brigade that will take care of the whole village and the whole community. And, um, and that's what we have. But I think we, we are now entering a stage where we need to discuss what's the value added of um, the supranational type of uh, uh, competencies and, and activities and and. And, and what uh, should we do ourselves? Because when you look, for example, at um, vaccination, mm -hmm. procurement has been done at the commission level, but the deployment, I mean, you don't want a commission to get into that at all. You know, this, is, this has to be done by, from the GPs to the nurses to whoever, uh, you know, can do that in, in a member state. So that's the discussion. But I think we are now, yeah, there is far more, uh, commitment to do it together. Also, uh, though we had a global health summit in, in Rome. This was co-chaired by Ursula von der Leyen and by Prime Minister Draghi as the, the uh, ongoing chair of the G20. And again, there was kind of, um, how to say, I was involved in these discussions. Um, I found that uh, uh, usually it's all sovereignty. It's my sovereignty and uh, we don't want, but here we can say, yes, we are sovereign, of course. However, uh, viruses uh, don't need visas, they have no passports. Uh, and I think the creation of HERA, um, which I hope will be approved today or tomorrow, uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow um, is, uh, is an indicator of that. But we need to go further. And I would say what we probably need is a, a legal framework um, for, um, you know, for when this crisis time, that's when you need to be able to take rapid decisions and have a, I'm not say central command in, in each member state, but also at European level. Whereas in between crises, one can do this in a, in a very different way. Um, in a, in a, and that's where exchange of information is, is really, uh, it's really key. And that even that in the beginning uh, was not happening, you know, sharing data. That's the, and that's now all going, uh, I would say rel relatively well. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, what you say about the setting up of HERA clearly is an important element, and I hope it does happen. Do you think then the EU will be in a better position to look at the emergence of these zoonotic diseases? I mean, I, I read somewhere that anything like five, to, well, there's millions of them out there, but this jump of, of the diseases from animals to humans now has become an issue that we are all beginning, like many scientists, to talk about. First of all, I should have said, told our audience that you yourself fell, fell uh, to the virus, and I hope and pray that you are well, you seem well, but you are now, as you call, an inside expert from experience, yes. and which probably yes. makes a difference to how you work. But the zoonotic diseases, about which mon most of us knew nothing, they are growing all the time. So will, will a body like Hera be able to 
monitor that and work with scientists working in the jungles and various areas where these uh, diseases emerge. No, you're absolutely right, uh, Nora. When you know, when you think of it, what do the flu, um, Ebola, HIV, um, SARS, uh, COVID have in common? They're zoonosis. They're all originated in. Uh, you know, in animals. I know there's some debate where, where exactly it's coming from. Uh, and it, you know, for SARS, it took about eight years to find the, the origin. So this, uh, it's a bit of, a, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack because, uh, you know, but it's coming from animals. So that's why the concept of uh, One Health is so important. Uh, if we only deal with, um, with us human yeah, animals, human primates, then uh, we're going to miss the boat. And so we need early surveillance. And that exists, for example, for influenza. For influenza, there is a worldwide network coordinated by the World Health Organization that um, tries to detect problems in birds. You would say birds and in poultry and all that, because most of the new uh, influenza uh, strains that cause a uh, an epidemic or a pandemic now and then, and, and we will... I hope we won't get that one at the same time as uh, as uh, COVID, eh? but uh, um, they originate in birds. And so then you have an early warning system. And here uh, it's explicit in the proposal by the commission that it would um, deal with early warning, but in collaboration. You know, you can't do that just in Europe. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean that all these viruses come from Africa or Asia. So we also have viruses and uh, you know, and, and microbes that can originate here. Uh, so uh, think of the, um, the uh, of the various variants. It is another term that's now very common. Uh, you know, for um, for COVID, of uh, uh, the first we had the British variant or the English variant. Although we're not allowed to say that anymore, it's now it was the Alpha variant. Yes. Um, so it can emerge anywhere. And um, and and one last point on this is. Um, it's clear to me that we're entering the age of pandemics. And why is that? It is to do with climate change. It is to do with population pressure, with uh, deforestation, with uh, urbanization, uh, with uh, uh, high mobility, a bit less at the moment. And that makes that um, the, um, uh, the opportunities for viruses which jump from some animals to us human species to develop into a big epidemic, that opportunity is much, much greater. I talk opportunity from the perspective of the virus. Um, and uh, what we cannot prevent is that viruses will jump from, uh, you know, from an animal to us. That's always going to happen. But there's more and more contact. There's this population pressure. So we can expect uh, more and more of these uh, uh, epidemics doesn't mean they have to become pandemics. It could be worse than what they have now, and it could be less. Um, but when you look at the statistics of the new viruses that have emerged in epidemics, uh, it's really going up uh, in a big way. Um, and that's not just because we are better equipped to diagnose them. Um, that because that could be a reason also. Uh, but uh, uh, and that's true that we uh, when we were. Uh, isolated Ebola virus in 1976. It took us several weeks. Today, um, it's more a matter of hours uh, or a day or two to find a new virus. That's because of technological advance. But it's because of this, uh, um, yeah, vicious circle of uh, um, climate change and environmental degradation, mobility, and urbanization that we we can expect more. So that means that. Today, we need not only to, do, to make sure we can stop this epidemic, and that's where the vaccine, the vaccination is number one, one approach, but also prepare for the next one. Sounds a bit depressing, but the best time to prepare for the next one is now. Yes, I, I see from some of the reading I've done that some of the scientists referred to chain of preparedness. And uh, I mean, when you talk about the climate changes, we tend to look at things like flooding and fires and that as being the signal uh, signals for climate change. But in fact, the pandemic has shown us that it is also very crucial to the loss of climate uh, effectiveness yeah. around the world. And so I, I just want to ask you, do you see going on, seeing as how you have quite a powerful position as advisor to the president of the commission, um, you can talk to the other commissioners about the area of climate change, about 
overseas development aid, what work should be getting done, particularly in continents like Africa, where, where they really are uh, not able to cope with this kind of pandemic. Do you see a shift in the kind of spending of official development aid on, on issues um, going forward? Yes, indeed, Nora. I think there is um, a shift, but that was, on the one hand, there's a shift that's directly linked to, uh, to COVID, um, and that there's going to be far more attention for pandemic preparedness, uh, not only from a perspective of uh, global health security, which was kind of a Western concept to protect uh, the wealthy countries uh, from viruses coming from poor countries. Uh, today, it's clear that, um, you know, this affects everybody. Um, so there's more attention for that. But then also on the negative side, because of all the of COVID itself and a decline in funding, other diseases have been suffering and development programs. Think of education. I mean, the, this is going to be a real, real long-standing disaster that uh, billions, literally billions of children have been uh, deprived of, um, of basic education uh, because of COVID. Uh, we know that is going to have... A, quite an impact on, on, on development. But on, on the positive side, from my perspective, is that um, take Africa, which I'm most familiar with in terms of uh, international development work, and where also uh, Ireland is, uh, uh, you know, very active. Um, and when I compare uh, today's situation with the, certainly the beginning of, uh, of, of HIV, of AIDS in the 90s, or 80s and 90s, and Ebola in 2014, there are increasingly strong institutions in Africa that we can work with. The capacity um, is more and more there. There is like a Africa Centers for Disease Control. Nigeria has one. There's in, in, in many countries have now a, um, institutions and very capable people. And so that is a big difference. And what we need to do is to work with them in function of their priorities and making sure that we can support them so that they can do their job. Um, and that's a shift and that's a good. What we are uh, struggling with, of course, is that um, many of the sustainable development goals will not be met. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that was already clear from uh, before COVID. The one I was involved with, with uh, on HIV and, and when we have some of these uh, goals where like we will eradicate, uh, I don't know how many diseases and, and this and that. I mean, that was not very realistic. It's good to have to be ambitious, but um, the clock is being set back for billions of people, also people uh, pushed into poverty. I was mentioning uh, education, but also the nutritional status. So that is an, uh, uh, quite an issue. And, and that's why um, when you look at uh, going back to HERA, for example, um, one of the uh, explicit goals of HERA uh, in the proposal is to uh, uh, stimulate and to support international collaboration, not only for um, international surveillance. We need to know what's going on thousands of miles from us. I mean, uh, uh, you know, most people in Europe had never, ever heard of Wuhan, uh, you know, but you know that some place, you know, 10,000 miles from us, uh, where it starts can uh, have a, such a devastating effect. So that means we need to know, that's for sure. And we need to be part of that international system. But also, um, for example, uh, is supporting Africa uh, for, to develop uh, manufacturing of vaccines. Mm -hmm. Africa produced about 1% of vaccines, but at the moment it was totally dependent on vaccine production in India. India is a pharmacy of the world. Um, However, since India had such a bad COVID problem, uh, Prime Minister Modi um, issued an export ban of any vaccine and the whole strategy of uh, you know, the international community of, uh, with COVAX and so on was to use Indian vaccines uh, in Africa. And uh, so uh, I know that manufacturing of vaccines is not an easy thing. It's, uh, it's gonna take time. But uh, when you take acid to Pasteur in Dakar, for example, they already produce a yellow fever vaccine that you can buy on the market. Um, there is capacity and um, uh, it'll take probably at least a year before, uh, you know, that will generate vaccines. Um, but um, uh, as I said, we need to be ready for future and that will help also mm -hmm. develop um, industrial um, 
capacity, provide jobs and so on in, in several African countries. Not every country. I mean, also in Europe, I mean, Ireland has a very thriving pharma sector, but not every country, Belgium also, but even some of the big ones don't have it. So that's why um, we, we need to, to play that role also uh, internationally. But we haven't done it fully. We could no, share. No, no, and, and clearly you've highlighted how important research and development and collaboration worldwide. It's we're, we're not on our own anymore as a no. European continent. We are now in the world. Mm -hmm.